Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, analysts arguing that Hamas is taking advantage of Israel's humanitarian nature. This as the Gaza borders reopen to workers from the Strip. Meanwhile, the political instability deepening as Yamina purges another MK from the party. And finally, Israel's second ever astronaut, Eitan Stebe, returning safely to Earth from the International Space Station. Israel loosening its grip now on Palestinian workers entering from the Gaza Strip, but that doesn't mean that the streets are necessarily safer, as overnight clashes with Israeli forces and attempted terror attacks continuing every day. ILTV's Asaf Nisan reporting. Israeli security forces continuing operations across the country and in Judea and Samaria Monday night. The IDF reportedly detaining at least 11 Palestinian terror suspects overnight. And in many cases, clashes against the IDF breaking out with dozens of Palestinians throwing stones, Molotov cocktails, and sending fires to tires in the streets. Then, just south of Jericho, in one such clash, the IDF critically wounding a 20-year-old Palestinian man who later died of his wounds. But it's unclear at this time if he was a participant in the riots. In any case, among the suspects detained, a Palestinian gun smuggler who crossed into Judea and Samaria from Jordan, the man arrested with 24 handguns and over $1.1 million worth in cash. Likewise, Israel foiling an attempt to smuggle dozens of fragmentation grenades and two rifles from Lebanon, the arms thought to be en route to terrorists in Israel in hopes of attacking crowded areas. And this, just days after two Arab Israelis arrested for working on behalf of Hezbollah or Iran for the same purpose. Then finally, the Shin Bet also foiling a potential bombing terror attack planned by a Gaza-based Islamic Jihad terror cell. The two suspects arrested in Jenin, including a 40-year-old mother of four, and this after having tested explosive devices. However, despite all this and several rocket attacks in the past week, Israel still reopening the Gaza borders to some 12,000 Palestinian workers, security officials arguing that enough calm has been restored to warrant these easing of restrictions. Joining now with more on the ongoing security crisis in Israel, former National Security Advisor and Research Fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and with the Jewish Institute for National Security of America, Major General in the IDF Reserves, Yaakov Amidrol. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, you know, Israel is easing restrictions on Gaza despite ongoing violence and incitement. Many are arguing that Hamas is therefore being emboldened. Would you agree? Um, I agree that it might help Hamas because the economic situation is very important for Hamas. But at the same time, it is you know a fine line between uh, putting too much pressure on the Gaza Strip to the point in which they don't have what to lose, and on the other side to let the civilians in Gaza to have enough um, bread, butter, and, and a better economy, so it will be understood for the population in Gaza and for Hamas, which is responsible for Gaza, that there is a cost for uh, violating the uh, uh, situation in, uh, in uh, Gaza and between Gaza and Israel. All right, moving now to the Palestinian Authority. In the Palestinian Authority, uh, and even on the PA's official TV channels, we again see imams calling for Allah to, quote, delight them with the extermination of the evil Jews. What's being done to counter such blatant incitement, and what can be done, really? I think that if we want to keep the the, um, the authority, um, which is responsible for the civil life of uh, civilian life of the civilians in area A and B, um, to stop the incitement will be almost impossible. I was a member of a committee, I think, twenty five years ago. Dealing with incitement, it is the the um, the, the um, DNA of the Palestinians uh, to incite against Israel, and at the end, this is the, our neighbors. It's something that we cannot change. I I think that the um, all the hopes that by the agreements with the Palestinians, incitement will be reduced, 
very uh, optimistic. It didn't happen. Well, so, I mean, here we're seeing these images of Palestinians throwing stones, and every night on the Temple Mount, Palestinians are collecting these stones, creating barricades, etc. Uh, you know, are security forces at least uh, are, are doing anything about that? You know, why not, uh, uh, why not lie in wait and do something overnight as opposed to waiting for the violence to kick off in the early morning? Yeah, I think that the, the, this is the, the main job of the, of the uh, police in, in those days in Jerusalem, and they, um, they understand the situation as, as well. Um, if it is within the boundaries of the mountain, I don't think that the, 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 the uh, police should uh, um, go in and, and, and going after them into the mosque. But if they are moving out of boundaries of the mountain towards the walling wall or um, against Jews who are going uh, visiting the the, uh, the the Temple Mountain, I think that the police should be very aggressive and to prevent it. Uh, all right, so it, it seems that Israel is creating an artificial distinction between Hamas and Islamic Jihad's activities in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, or even with Lebanon. Would you agree that that's the case? And, and you know, what would the benefit of doing that be? I, I think that the, the only benefit for that is that we are not connecting the, the uh, three different uh, parts of, uh, of these actions is because if you do it, you doomed to go to a big operation in Gaza, and it's not our interest today. Uh, we should focus our attention on other issues and try to minimize the um, the uh, effectiveness of the Hamas and Islamic Jihad to bring Israel um, into a big operation. It's the interest of uh, Islamic Jihad. It's not the interest of uh, Hamas, and we have to play between the friction and and to find the way how we are minimizing the to Israeli interest. And at the same time, um, the situation is not deteriorating into a big operation in Gaza. And uh, yes, it's a very problematic and uh, artificial de and definition. Well, conversely, you know, over the last few days, for example, we've seen a number of Islamic Jihad terror plots being foiled, including a bombing attack. And over the weekend, most of the rockets that were fired towards Israel, if not all of them, were fired by Islamic Jihad operatives. Why not target Islamic Jihad directly in the Strip as opposed to only hitting Hamas as the sovereign entity uh, in Gaza? First, I have to emphasize that very, very few rockets have been launched in the last uh, few days uh, from Gaza. <coughs> and part of it was Hamas tried to prevent it. And it is our interest not to um, connect Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Well, so, that's, so that's really my point. Why not go then directly after Islamic Jihad as opposed to Hamas? Because what we want to have is a clear address in, in the in, um, industry. And for us, the, the um, address is Hamas responsible for the for um, Gaza Strip, we cannot make, we should not be the judges who would say, okay, it's um, A did it, so we will attack A. If it's B, we will attack B. There is one address, it's the Hamas, it's the responsibility for Hamas, and we should do whatever is needed to make Hamas understand that he's responsible for Gaza. He's has, he has many benefits because of that, but he has some responsibilities because of that and should understand their responsibilities. Major General Amidol, thank you so much for joining us. You are must master. In other news, in a shocking political update, renegade Yamina MK and longtime critic Amichai Shikli has just been formally declared a hostile defector in a 7-0 vote at the Knesset House Committee. The move legally barring Shikli from running for the next Knesset with any current faction, including the Likud, and he cannot be a minister or deputy minister in the current Knesset either. Here with the analysis is chief political correspondent with the Jerusalem Post, Gil Hoffman. Gil, it's great to have you back with us. You know, my first question is, why now? What's the purpose of this vote to make, you know, is it to make an example of Chikli? Uh, the goal of this vote is to try to keep the current government together. Um, you know, Chikli had already been a renegade MK who was going against the government on every issue from day one. He voted against the formation of this government. He voted against the state budget. Um, and now 
when you have a real threat to bring the government down, where the former coalition chairwoman, Edith Stillman, was conspiring with other MKs, Bennett had to put his foot down and show that there are consequences toward going against the government. And if it succeeded, then you, instead of having it be a 60 to 60 coalition opposition fight, it's, it's 60 to 59, mm. because uh, Stillman would be deterred. She would see that uh, she can uh, vote for things that the opposition wants, but she can't vote against the government. She would have to at least absent herself, which would keep the coalition's majority. Well, so might this actually, in a sense, martyr Shikli in a way that makes his voice or his opinions more powerful? Absolutely. Yesterday, uh, I was at the hearing, and uh, Amichai Shikli gave a really beautiful, impassioned speech. I mean, regardless of where you're on the political map, it was very impressive. And uh, he became uh, a, a leader of the right, very much. Uh, all, all the right-wing MKs in the room clapped for him. Um, Netanyahu put out a video supporting him. Um, I think at the uh, expense of building up Shikli, uh, Bennett had to take this step to temporarily bring him down. All right, so, and again, though, this seems like a fairly hostile action. Might it, in, in effect, push, especially after his impassioned speech, might it push more right-wing MKs to actually side with him and with Edith Sinman and defect? Uh, no, uh, because uh, they want to run with an established party in the next uh, election. There's also a significant possibility that Netanyahu could still reach a plea agreement in the year ahead and allow somebody else in the Likud to get elected leader of the party, which would enable the formation of a new government by, led by Likud in the current Knesset with 80 right-wing MKs plus blue and white. Um, and someone declared a defector cannot serve as a minister or a deputy minister. So why would any wavering MK shoot himself in the foot like that? I think that declaring Shikli a defector actually helped in the deterrence successfully. I, well, I mean, you mentioned, uh, again, that he uh, got these standing ovations, that he brought people ideologically uh, over to his side. Is it at all possible that he and other defectors might just form successfully a new party in, in the next election? I mean, is he truly that hurt? It's really complicated because uh, Saar's party still exists. I, I don't know if Yamina still exists, but uh, how many parties can you have on the right? Uh, it's much easier to run in Likud. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised still if we're right before or right after the legal process ends in the courts, there's a district court appeal. Mm. Shikli might still quit uh, in order to leave open the possibility of running in Likud. Um, you know, people, politicians want to remain politically unshackled. Do you think that there's, that there's a chance to get this decision overturned, or, or is that boat sailed? Look, the legal argument is very solid. The, the, uh, he is correct in saying that the original bill was intended to stop members of Knesset from jumping ship in return for enticements, appointments, and he hasn't gotten any of those officially yet mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and uh, that it's not intended to punish a member of Knesset for maintaining his ideology while his party leader does not. That's all on very solid ground. Uh, but there's decades of precedent of the, the courts trying to not get involved in, in purely political issues. All right, Gil Hoffman, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Now, a new survey among Jews in the United States and Israel finding that nearly a quarter of American Jewish millennials agree with the idea of distancing themselves from Israel in order to better fit in with their communities. With me to discuss is spokesperson and Access Israel manager with the American Jewish Committee in Jerusalem, Liron Koret. Liron, thank you for joining. Now, you know, you were involved in the study. Was this a surprising statistic to you? I think that in a way, uh, speaking also as a millennial myself, who has experienced uh, also uh, campus, uh, like life on American campuses, mm -hmm. and also growing up here, I think that seeing that statistic was jarring, it was concerning, but I wouldn't necessarily say I was surprised. However, knowing that here we are uh, on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel, knowing that this thing is this phenomenon is happening on American campuses where 
um, Jewish students and Jewish millennials feel like they need to disguise their Jewish identity, sure. where they need to feel like they need to reconsider larger commitments, for example, to Israel, um, to fit among themselves, uh, among them friends is, is deeply concerning. Well, and again, you know, what are some of the reasons for, for these attitudes? What are, what are they hoping to gain from that? In terms of distancing, I think that there is this idea of wanting to belong and a lot of pressures, um, especially coming from BDS movements and the delegitimization campaign against Israel. And it's terrifying to see that they wouldn't necessarily have a different option, a different way to take action. And we need to reassess and see what we can do to help. So if the millennials, you know, who, who made these comments who want to blend in, if they, do they feel like it's effectively shielding them from anti-Semitism? Because historically, anti-Semites don't differentiate between the good and the bad Jews. Absolutely. I think that this might just be um, a feeling, but I definitely agree with you that this is not the solution. This is not a way to, um, to fight anti-Semitism. And more so, you know, our survey found that 76% of Israelis and 50% of uh, American Jews do see the, the source of anti-Semitism being this delegitimization campaign, ongoing delegitimization campaign on, on campuses and in their environment, whereas about 18% uh, percent of American Jews and only 6% of Israelis saw the cause being more of a uh, situation coming from Israel's politics and uh, in relationship with uh, the Palestinian Authority. 20% right. um, of Americans also found that neither one of these uh, reasons are, are the cause for anti-Semitism. So I think that when we, when we take that into account, um, it's clear that this not, not only puts us in a difficult situation and trying to figure out what to do, but um, it's, it's, it's concerning. So especially on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day, as you mentioned, you know, these statistics are somewhat alarming. What can be done to support victims of this anti-Israel, anti-Semitic mob mentality and pressure? Right. So I think that um, a huge issue is this idea of, of intersectionality and the fact that in a way, if you need, if you want to belong to a group where that believes in human rights and believes in, 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 in doing good um, and in, in, in equality, I think that there's this false understanding that if you are one thing, you can't be the other. And I think that messaging um, and working directly with, with uh, schools and um, empowering Jewish advocates. This is something that we do and we will continue to do. And also, there are also really positive uh, statistics that we found um, in this survey that is reassuring as well. The, the fact that 80% um, of Israeli respondents, 70% yeah. of American Jewish respondents um, believe in a strong state of Israel that is necessary to the survival of the Jewish people. And um, the flip uh, of it, the idea that a strong diaspora in the U.S. is important for the survival of the state of Israel is also extremely supported by 80% um, of American Jews and 70% of Israelis. Right. Um, so I think that there is room to, to build on. We have like a strong foundation. We have the strong bond and we mm -hmm. just need to figure out a way um, to encourage these one in right. four um, to feel at home and belong. All right, Liron, thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much. Moving now to Florida's Atlantic coastlines, we have Splashdown. Israeli astronaut Eitan Stibbe and three other astronauts members of the first all-private mission to the International Space Station, safely returning to Earth. After two weeks aboard the International Space Station, Israel's second-ever astronaut Eitan Stibi and the three other members of the Axiom-1 crew gently drifting back to Earth in the SpaceX Dragon capsule. And welcoming Stibi home, Israeli President Isaac Herzog congratulating the astronaut with a new take on Neil Armstrong's famous quote. Herzog saying one small step for man and one giant leap for the state of Israel and mankind's space mission. But indeed, with this, history is truly in the making. 
the Axiom-1 mission being the first fully privatized mission to the ISS orbiting outpost, where the crew spent 17 days. And even more importantly, Elon Musk's SpaceX project, in extensive partnerships with NASA, stressing its experimental and research focus, as opposed to the tourism-like projects carried out by Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic. Taken aboard the ISS with Stevie and the others, 25 scientific and biomedical experiments, including MIT-designed robotic smart tiles that can self-assemble into various structures, and experiments for discovering new methods of cancer screening. Additionally, the now multiple times repeated success of the Falcon 9 reusable rocket, Dragon capsules, and other SpaceX technologies quickly advancing SpaceX's and NASA's ultimate goal, which is to eventually commercialize the lower Earth orbit region of space and to replace and wholly retire the International Space Station itself by around 2030. And now for a little escapism, all the Israel tourism-related news that you should probably hear. And taking us away, ILTV reporter Marnie Shamroth. Marnie, take it away. Thank you, Aaron. So let's get started. The sky's the limit now with more than 80 countries allowing people to travel without taking any COVID tests. This is groundbreaking, no pun intended, since we've been waiting for a long time to travel without the chaotic stress of planning COVID tests. With all of this happening, Israel is also considering canceling their PCR tests at the entry of the country. As of now, people who are entering or leaving Israel have to take private COVID tests that could cost between 60 to 80 shekels. That adds up really quickly. So now the spread of the virus is decreasing, but the health ministry is still not fully convinced that this is the right move and are concerned that we'll have another corona wave, which I don't know if we can honestly handle that any longer. But the alternative option is to do sample tests only from specific countries. So this could affect the traffic at Ben Gurion Airport as today the test complex is located in the terminal areas that subtracts to 45 counters for testing. If the number of tests are reduced, the number of test counters can be increased for the benefit of the passengers, hopefully. And I have even more good news. Just a week after the USA removed their mask mandate on airplanes, Israel also might follow its lead. After two years of getting used to wearing masks on flights, Israel is considering canceling it. At first, the obligation to wear masks on domestic flights was removed after it was decided to remove them in public spaces throughout the country. So does this mean that we'll soon be able to finally enjoy traveling internationally without masks? The health ministry has not made any decisions as of yet, especially after the discovery of a new variant that arrived in Israel from South Africa. Great, another one. But we're keeping our fingers crossed and hope that we can travel freely again like we used to, God willing. And now that Passover is behind us, there seems to be a drop in prices in vacation packages. So here's a list for the best deals for those who are itching to travel like me abroad. Dubai, for example, has dropped its usual prices from $700 to $300. That's more than half their package value. Insane. Next is Antalya, Turkey, where you can get a three-night deal for $429 compared to last week, where the package deal cost was $599. Now, third is the beautiful country of Prague for a deal of $220 compared to Passover's deal of $611 per person. Insane. Now, this drop of prices can save up to 30% of vacation expenses. So it's best to take advantage of this now before they go back this summer. You know where I will be next week. So uh, that's it for today. And back to you, Aaron. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies across most areas around the country tonight with the same expected tomorrow. Then this evening's lows averaging a cooler 14 to 16 degrees Celsius or 57 to 60 Fahrenheit. And tomorrow, it's warming up again with top temperatures ranging from 21 to 31 degrees Celsius or 70 to 87 Fahrenheit. All right, that is it for today's news. But for more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to head to ILTV.tv or to an app store and subscribe to our newsletter as well as to our streaming platform, ILTV+. Plus. It's available on all devices and on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. I'm Aaron Porras. Be well and thank you so much for watching. Stay informed with the latest Israel news, live programs, culture, kosher cooking, and more on ILTV+. Subscribe on any device now and get a free month trial. Go to www.iltv.tv, add ILTV Plus on Roku, 
or download ILTV Plus from the Apple or Android app stores.